أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ونبينا أبو القاسم الأمين وعلى أهل بيت الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المظلومين Dear respected viewers, thank you for joining us once more on this your show broadcasting live from the holy city of Karbala Back to the basics in which of course we have been discussing a sustainable approach in how to discuss our differences with others and also reach a more sustainable understanding of our very doctrinal, jurisprudential as well as ethical beliefs in comparison and in dialogue with the beliefs in doctrine, ethics and jurisprudence of others. Now, for those of you who may be tuning in for the first time, it may be assumed, it may be deduced from the fact that we are on a Shia channel and that we are broadcasting live from the holy city of Karbala and indeed perhaps even just based upon previous material of mine which has of course been broadcast that this is a show polemically discussing some of our differences with other schools of Islam now whilst we definitely intend to reach those discussions with those of other schools of Islam and we have indeed engaged in just some of her critiques of Shiism and applying a worldview method to analyzing what they have to say. It is not our intention to enter into a mudslinging match with anyone and indeed whilst it certainly is something which is appealing to those of us in our youth, to those of us who grow up in a, in a very iron sharpens iron type world, where we almost lock horns with anyone who, who disagrees with us on the smallest of things. It has been my experience that such an approach is neither productive nor particularly fruitful. And more importantly, it carries far more obligations as well as it can lead one out with the specific boundaries provided and stipulated by the holy imams with the peace and blessings of Allah be upon them from the Ahlul Bayt with the peace and blessings of Allah be upon them all now I state this in the introduction because I want everyone to be aware of where we are and inshallah ta'ala where we want to be heading we certainly don't want to head into a direction where our sole concern is to act polemically, nor one where we are condescending towards the beliefs of others intentionally. We must understand that there are many people that are born into the belief systems that we may find heavy disagreement with. And traditionally, people who are born into such have a unique way of being able to adapt, being able to justify why they believe in certain things. And this is true of anyone that follows any religion. This is not something confined to just the human psychology of Muslims. So indeed, we need to be very careful, very delicate. And more importantly, we need to make sure that we do not judge anyone else for what they believe. Because were it not for the grace of Allah Azza wa Jal, were it not for this enrichment that we have been provided, we may have never known of the original Islam of Ali Muhammad. May the peace and blessings of Allah be upon them all. And on that note, dear viewers, I'd like to continue where we left off from shortly before the Christmas break, according to, of course, the calendars that you are all following in the Western and largely non-Muslim parts of the world. The last special kind of detour we had taken in order to accommodate some of the requests and also for a slight change of hand seasonally was of course the approach of looking at the intellect in light of the wasiyah of Imam al-Kavm alayhi salatu wasalam to one of the greatest companions Hisham ibn al-Hakam and we stated that this wasiyah, this particular piece of advice has been carried and taken by many of the ulama, many of the scholars who have derived from such a beautiful narration and very insightful one. The realities 
of the human intellect. Now, of course, I want to just focus on one line before we move back to almost a conjunction between where we left off prior to doing its special seasonal detour and also where we left off from the special seasonal detour. Imam Al-Kazim states to Hisham in this very golden wasiya that, O oh Hisham, Allah Azza wa Jal has two arguments, two hujjas against the people, that is to say upon the people. Upon the people there are two things that will bear witness either in favor of them, if they of course act in line of those two arguments, or against them. And what are these two arguments? One is explicit and the other is implicit. And of course these words are very known in the English language, the explicit meaning that which is manifestly apparent or that which is in front of us and the implicit of course being that which is slightly more discreet. The explicit arguments of God, the explicit hujaj of Allah Azza wa Jal are the apostles, the prophets and the imams. May the peace and blessings of Allah be upon all of those individuals. The implicit arguments are the minds. That is to say, they are the aqul, they are the intellects. O oh Hisham, the true intelligent is he whose legal gotten provisions do not divert him from thanking God, and whose illegal gotten provisions do not divert him from being tolerant. O oh Hisham, as for those who extinguish the illumination of thinking with the long expectations, erase the novel faculties of wisdom with curious wording and extinguish the lights of learning with the personal whims, they will back their whims to ruin their brains. Those who ruin their minds will surely devastate their worldly and religious affairs. O oh, Hisham, how can you come, how come you expect that God will accept your deeds while you are involving your mind with matters that are far away from God's commandments and you are complicit with your whims and letting them overcome and overpower your mind. Of course, anyone which is capable of accessing the great work Tuhaf al-Aqul, that is to say, we, I believe it has been translated into English under the title, The Masterpieces of the Intellect. I would very much recommend that they read this very excellent and beneficial wasiya given to Hisham ibn al-Hakam by Imam Musa bin Ja'far al-Kavim alayhi salatu wassalam for indeed it is one of the pieces of advice which anyone that is able to reflect will certainly gain much benefit from and of course anyone that happens to be watching this from a non-Muslim background or indeed a non-Shia background, I would even recommend it to them because there is much insight in there, which we, if we were to apply in our daily lives, and that is not to say by any means that I have applied such in my daily life, and we ask Allah Azza wa Jal for all of us, and particularly myself, to be of those who are able to apply this in their daily lives, then they would find in it much benefit and much wisdom, for certainly the words of the Ahlul Bayt are containing the ultimate truth and that truth which shall set us free. Back to our topic for tonight inshallah ta'ala just to explain where we have left off. Prior to the seasonal slight detour that we took we had demonstrated quite proficiently that there are a plethora of atheist thinkers who in accepting the consequences of the atheist worldview, in accepting that there is of course a consequence to denying the existence of Allah Azza wa Jal, they have acknowledged that there is a worldview that comes along with this denial. They have acknowledged that there is a consequence to denying the existence of a deity, for certain the de existence of a deity, that deity who we call Allah Azza wa Jal, fulfills certain explanations and criteria by which we can ground, justify and understand certain phenomenon around us. When one extrapolates, extracts and removes entirely 
the concept of Allah Azawajal from our functioning sane worldviews, then what you would find is that such a worldview would, if embraced to its logical consequences, collapse entirely and cease to have the stability and functionality and even sanity that our worldview once previously had. And for those of you that doubt that, one can merely refer back to what has been stated by Dr. Alex Rosenberg and was cited heavily in the episodes entitled Introduction to Worldview. Now, in continuing, before moving on to the greater topic of tonight, which of course is an extension of one of the actualizations, realizations, admissions of Dr. Alex Rosenberg and those atheists who have embraced an entire package of beliefs as a result of their disbelief in God, which is of course, as you shall probably notice from the title of tonight's episode, all about morality. I just wanted to cite something very important in understanding the worldview of the Ahlul Bayt and in understanding their prescriptions and descriptions of human reality. We as human beings, of course, are very interesting creatures. And as I have pointed out in many episodes prior to this, it is not that the atheist interlocutor who I am engaging with is less qualified than myself. Absolutely not. I'm sure that, of course, the natural sciences being some of the areas which I tended to not show too much of an interest in, these individuals would by far excel my knowledge in them. By far. I mean, they're leading experts in their field. And more importantly, I'm sure that even on an IQ test, such individuals might score much higher than myself. So what is it that has blocked and censored their minds from understanding how absurd on the apparent what they're saying seemingly is? Is it merely something purely related to what we would call intelligence? in our Western understanding of a word, or is there something more to it? Of course, I have argued that veneration of the Imams, veneration of the Prophet Sallallahu which states, A'arafakum bi nafsihi, A'arafakum bi rabbihi, the one who is more in, in tune to a knowledge of himself is of course more in tune to a knowledge of his Lord, has a great link and connection to the topic we're discussing at the moment. That is to say, one thing we realize is these atheists, they take the concept of God. They realize that without Allah, we have no explanatory power for what we see in front of us. And yet, instead of following that through with what the average human being would do and say, well, therefore, I can't accept such an insane world. I'm going to hold on to the concept of God. They will instead choose to accept and embrace an insane world which belies every facet of their experience, the way they live their lives on a day-to-day basis, and everything that their mind tells them. In fact, rendering the mind an invalid and useless tool, merely a deception imposed upon humans by evolutionary coping mechanisms. But dear viewers, more upon that after the break, inshallah ta'ala, I hope that you'll join me for such. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome back, dear viewers. Um, I would like to primarily return to our topic before we continue to go on to a tangent about the effects of morality because I had introduced what our topic was tonight purely in order to explain in which direction we're going as opposed to wanting to jump immediately into that topic. The topic which we're discussing is that those who seemingly understand human reality and understand the limitations of everything around us, the physical reality around us, and understand the limitations that would be entailed by accepting the physicalist, naturalist, godless worldview of Alex Rosenberg, would understand that essentially it's absurd. Essentially it boils down to saying that 
this is what is seemingly true, but it, if it is true, I could never really know it because at the end of the day, there's no such thing as a thought process. So any thoughts I have about this topic are likewise illusions because that's what my worldview teaches. Now, there are some who are willing to take that red pill and jump into the world of the matrix or go down the rabbit hole and join Alice in Wonderland with such unique thoughts. But the rest of us are unwilling to believe that our entire collective human experience has all been a giant illusion imposed upon our minds and that essentially every event has merely been predetermined by a previous physical event and when we break down our essence and existence we are nothing more than physical atoms, fermions and bosons floating about in space clashing into one another. It's interesting just how much of an emphasis the Ahlul Bayt والسلام, the Imams of Ali Muhammad have placed upon the concept of self-introspection. Of course, we've already cited the narration which states, Man arafa nafsuhu faqad arafa rabbuhu. Whoever knows himself knows his Lord. We've already cited the narration that sets, Arafakum bi nafsihi, arafakum bi rabbihi. Whoever knows more about himself would certainly know more or be inclined towards more knowledge about his Lord. Now, Amir al Mu'mineen alayhi salatu wasalam, in one of the works of traditions entitled Al Ghurar wal Durar of Al Amudi, there is within it a chapter which cites all the narrations in pertinence to the concept of knowing oneself. Allow me to read some of these narrations and the varying variations which are found therein. An intelligent person is one who knows himself and does things with sincerity. Knowledge of the self is the more beneficial of the two forms of knowledge. A knower, an arif, is someone who knows his self and releases it and repels it from anything that would further it from Allah Azza the greatest of ignorance is a person's ignorance of his own self. The greatest of wisdom is a person's knowledge of his self. People who have the knowledge of their selves have more fear of their Lord. The best of the intellect is a person's knowledge of his own self. So whoever knows his self will be more knowledgeable and he who is ignorant of his self will fall astray. It surprises me that someone who has lost something searches for it while he has lost himself but does not look for it. It surprises me that a person who is ignorant of his self, how can he expect to know his Lord? The goal of knowledge is for a person to know his self. How can one who does not know others know his self? It is sufficient in knowledge for a person to know his self. It is sufficient in ignorance for a person to have ignorance of his self. He who knows his self will struggle with it. He who is ignorant of his self will neglect it. He who knows his self knows his Lord. He who knows his self will increase in status. He who is ignorant of his self will be more ignorant in knowing others. He who knows his self will be more knowledgeable of others. He who knows his self will have reached the ultimate goal of every knowledge and science. He who does not know his self will become far away from the path of salvation and he will fall into aberration and ignorance. Knowledge of the self is the most beneficial form of knowledge. Those who gain knowledge of the self will have achieved the greatest of triumph. And lastly, do not be ignorant of yourself for he who is ignorant of knowing himself is ignorant of everything. So when we see that Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salatu wasalam, Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib placed this great emphasis on knowledge of the self. We ask, is there any particular reason for why that is? And I believe that this will tie in very heavily with this absurd worldview that intelligent people like Alex Rosenberg and others have fallen into purely because they wish to deny the existence of a God, the God who created them and brought them into existence and the God who sustains this universe. Now, if knowledge is one of the consequences of rejecting God, then there, of course there's a much more dangerous and detrimental one that could physically impact us on a day-to-day -day level. 
That, of course, is what we call the dilemma of morality for the atheist. Now, the dilemma of morality is quite worrying, for in the past, the atheist would at least try to acknowledge that, no, there can be an objective form of morality, that I can still be moral and be atheist. Now, of course, I don't want any believers out there to misunderstand what I am stating. I believe atheists can be moral, and I believe in many cases they are more moral than many people who claim to be believers. Why is this? Because we don't live in the atheist world, we live in the real world. And from my vantage point, in the real world, there's a God, and that God has given us morality. I'm stating that if we ask the question, if we ask the question of accountability and explanatory power, if we were to assume the very foundational assumptions of atheism, philosophically and according to the, Adam, the absolute absence of metaphysics in the atheist worldview, then we would also assume that there is no such thing as morality. Now, am I arguing this from a vacuum? Again, this is not the case. Many atheists have traditionally argued that God is a necessary condition for objective moral values and the sort of moral truths that are discovered and not merely created by human beings and which are valid and binding whether anybody believes in them or not. Allow me to cite the philosopher Jean-Paul Sartre, a very important French, French existential philosopher. He states, when we speak of abandonment, a favorite word of Heidegger, of course Heidegger is another existentialist philosopher, we only mean to say that God does not exist and that it is necessary to draw the consequences of his absence right to the end. See, this is an atheist that's willing to roll and run entirely with the consequences of his worldview. Someone that is literally willing to apply Qa'adat al-Ilzam upon himself. The existentialist is strongly opposed to a certain type of secular moralism which seeks to suppress God at the least possible expense. Towards 1880, when French professors endeavored to formulate a secular morality, they said nothing will be changed if God does not exist. We shall rediscover the same norms of honesty, progress, and humanity, and we shall have disposed of God as an out-of-date hypothesis which will die away quietly of itself. The existentialist, on the contrary, finds it extremely embarrassing that God does not exist, for there disappears with him all possibility of finding values in an intelligible heaven. There can no longer be any good a priori, since there is, in, since there is no way of finding, sorry, since there is no infinite and perfect consciousness to think of it. It is nowhere written that good exists, that one must be honest or one must not lie, since we are now upon the plane where there are only men. Dostoevsky once wrote, if God does not exist, everything would be permitted. That, for existentialism, is the starting point. Everything is indeed permitted, that is to say morally, in terms of good and bad, Everything is indeed permitted, it's allowed, if God does not exist and man is in consequence forlorn. For if he cannot find anything to depend upon either within or outside himself. So there you have it. This is exactly the route that these individuals are willing to go down in their stubborn rejection of the concept of God. And of course, we'll continue with this analysis tomorrow. Dear viewers, thank you so much for joining me and I pray that you're all doing well. Please do not forget us in your du'as and in likewise, we shall not forget you in our du'as here in the holy city of Karbala. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.